to be thankful and appreciative, so we think it's in the proper order that we celebrate moms today. In fact, there's just so much of, about uh, Mother's Day that is in the context of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that just speaks of the ministry of a mother in the home. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but first let me give you a quick report. Go ahead and roll that uh, video you have there, the Belize Pastors. I, I'll talk over it for a little bit because uh, the audio didn't pick up until they start talking, but it's just a couple of pictures in the context of, uh, of our ministry time in Belize, meeting with all the pastors, the Baptist churches there. Uh, many of them, as I said last week, expressed great words of appreciation to you and for this church doing all that it's done. Dr. Autry, who's been in our service before, Nick Harris was also with us, uh, teaching our pastors along with me. It's a glorious, glorious time of the Lord. But let me hear a quick word from these guys just uh, on the appreciation uh, words. Let me take this opportunity, indeed, you know, I was sitting on the back there through all this time together, but I definitely, I believe that in ministries that God has blessed us with, there's a time that we get discouraged, you know, but but the very time that you think you're getting, you cannot go no more than only get one, you strong, right? Because it's Christ that is in us. He do his ways, we do not know how, but he always put people in our time when the most time we need. One year ago, um, during our conference like this, is that they passed pass all that same little information. And we, I'm to the back there again, sitting down, and I said, I remember Miss Pop one time, she said, I just tired of this, you know. He said, We always go to PPD, and there are times we go to sleep, and we miss the bus, and we reach home and late. You know, but there are times that come, and we said, You know what? Whatever God wants, we're going to do it. Amen. So last year, I put on a note that said, we really need a vehicle. You know? It was just kind of like, yeah. I really never meant it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it back then. <laughs> but a little while after that, when I um, was a Joe Carl, I said, you serious? It's kind of like, I said, my goodness. I said, praise God. You know, because it's Miss Papa said, do you hear it? Do you remember when you complained the last time? You said, ring, we can't reach back to Punta Gorda. But Pastor Joe, I want to say, this is your church. Thanks a lot. We praise God for every one of you. And uh, we constantly in prayer for your church Thank you, brother. and the fellowship. Amen. Thank you. I surely have to spoke up some room. <laughs> I'm sure she does. <laughs> Amen. And uh, just when we think 
when you pray and you ask God for a need and you feel like God doesn't hear your need, my brother, keep praying. Don't have any doubt when you pray and ask God for, for needs. But God is good and we want to say thank you very much, Pastor Joe. I appreciate it. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Well, praise. Let's just a couple. We had some more, but they didn't come out so well on the videos with the sound and stuff. That first pastor, Pastor Pop, Katrino Pop and his wife, they minister to the Mayans down in the southern part of Belize and uh, three cultural areas, basically, in that southern area of Belize is, is mostly Mayans, and they've helped lead a whole crusade that was in their sports facility down there. But they also did a lot of ministries in little vill villages like Hickety, and they'd have to wait for a bus. They, like she said, most people go to lunch after church, we go find a bus that was going down and it's really erratic the buses are down there. They said if they want to run or not, it's just up in the middle of the day. And then many days they get to a village and the service time would be over, people would be at home. And so uh, I've watched them over the last several years just fulfill that ministry down there and thinking, you know, those folks need a vehicle. And of course, uh, last year, the year before this last year, we put out a, uh, a form to the pastors. We always put out a form when they register for these conferences that ask them about their needs and what their needs are. This last time was very specific. We asked them what their physical needs were, what their spiritual needs were in their church and what was going on in their families and stuff. And about 12 of those pastors put things that we, as we prayed over, we felt like that was the ones when, that the Lord wanted our church to be a part of helping. We took about, and we shared this with you through, over this last year, we took around $50,000, $60,000 and did a lot of work in those churches down there. That's from you, and that's from uh, your gracious kindness to be a part of the ministries that are there. So give the Lord a hand again, amen, and give yourself a hand for being a part of that. But uh, today's message I've entitled A Mom's Heart, and you're just going to run this for me because I don't see the thing up here at all. But uh, it's only about four slides, so it's pretty simple, all right? But we'll just leave it on that slide for a moment while I make this introduction. You know, one thing that I do want to say, as I said a, a little bit a, a while ago, that the ministry... The, of the Holy Spirit is very similar to the ministry of a mom. And a lot of times people don't, don't realize that. And I'm not saying that, that the Holy Spirit's a mother, okay? That's not what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And, uh, but the ministry that it carries out, in the Old Testament, it talks about hovering over the, over the earth and when it's formed without void and God created. Now the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. And, and again, in Isaiah and, and the, the prophets who talked about the ministry of how that God would hover over Jerusalem like a, like a mother hen over its chicks. And there's lots of terminologies like that. And even the ministry of being a comforter and nurturing ministry to the saints and the disciples is so familiar. If you ever want to pick up a words of duplication for you moms to go back to Scripture, those are words that really describe your ministry uh, of nurturing and caring and protecting and providing and feeding and gathering. Those are so much of the ministry uh, that mothers have. It's so in line with the work of the Holy Spirit's work in our particular life. But our passage today is, is 3 John, the third letter of John that he writes, and it's just one verse. It's verse 4, and I'll just share it with you. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. And this is the Apostle John, obviously, as he's writing to the churches that he's been establishing, and he sends back to them a word. And he's rejoicing about the acts of God and how they've been responding and how they've been growing. And he writes to them, and he says, my little children. Now, that is a word that, that, he, that many first century rabbis used in the church who were the teachers and the leaders. They often referred to their disciples, their spiritual offspring, as their children. And he's writing this to them. But this is a word that my mom embraced very early on in life as a mom. Mother of six kids, gone on to be with Jesus. Praise the Lord, she needed a rest. Amen? But... Uh, it's exciting that we'll look back on her life and see how much of her life just reflected Jesus. I mean, raising six kids, we were maniacs, you know. Uh, my brothers and sisters aren't in this service today, so I'm just going to tell on them. They were terrible. <laughs> and boys are especially crazy. Can I get an amen down here? You know, we like little murderers. We just we torture each other and kill each other. And, you know, then we got through torturing each other, we torture our sisters. You know how that works. But what a gracious mother, but her graciousness and her kindness and her patience went back clearly to the, her commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, and she never hesitated to tell you about that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. But this was a verse of Scripture that she adopted very early on as her passion as a mom. Every one of my siblings have this verse in their home somewhere. She printed it out in cards. She printed it out in letters. She made those little postcards that some of you are familiar with that she would write to people. I have this postcard to this day, and so do my brothers and sisters. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. What an anthem verse, amen? It's an anthem verse for, for, for a spiritual leader. It's an anthem verse for a mom. As a spiritual leader, I get blessed 
by many people who write me. In fact, this last couple of months, Kathy and I have been getting lots of notes and emails and Facebook posts or something from people that we disciple back in the 70s and 80s, you know, people that uh, were in high school back then. We were barely in our 20s, but we were ministering to them with street ministries and outreach ministries, and so many of them turned to Christ. We were able to, I don't know, I mean, hundreds of young people we got to lead to Jesus, thousands maybe over those years of ministry. But to hear back from them and to listen to their testimonies today. Some recently wrote, said, hey, I've just, you know, wanted you to know that I'm a pastor now, and, you know, I was under your ministry for a few years while I was in high school. When I left for college, I never have cut, reached back and reached out to you, but I want you to know that the impact of those years of my life literally changed the course of my life. And not only this last guy that wrote me was just saying, not only that, I came with these, se these several friends of mine, and they're all involved in ministry in some fashion. One's a missionary, others are involved in different areas of ministry. Th those are exciting, encouraging things to hear from people. So m moms, I'm going to tell your children today, let mom know that she's made a difference in your life, you know. Let people know when they've encouraged you. Let people know when they've helped you. You know, because most of the time, we never hear about those things as, as parents. We never hear about it. You never hear them as mothers many times. Actual words of this is what God has done in my life because of you. Here's how I've been blessed because of you. And, and John the Apostle's writing say, you know, my greatest desire for your life is this. I have no greater joy than to know that you're walking in truth. I have no greater joy than to look back in time and see that people's lives have been changed. But obviously for a mom, I mean, she let this be known very clear. There's about three things I want to look at. First of all, let's relate this to a mom. Let's talk about the mom here from this passage. And, and obviously, this is John in this relationship, but I think it's pretty transferable to stay even in the context. We're, we're talking about this is someone who's speaking who is responsible for bringing other lives into reality. Well, those were spiritual lives here, but we're talking about physical lives that he's, you know, that he's changed in John, but you're talking about physical lives that you've changed by bringing into this world. You're the first one to hold them, the first first one to hug them, the first one to kiss them, the first, you know, person to change diapers and to clean up their mess, the first person to, to, to hear the first word spoken, to teach them how to take those first steps. Certainly we ought to see that there's someone here that has the greatest joy of their life. But this particular verse, and if you're this kind of particular mom in that regard, this should be a passion of your life. Here's a mom who just wants one to see that God is honored in her life. If you really want to say Happy Mother's Day, if your mom's a believer and a Christian, the best way you can share Happy Mother's Day with her is to show her the impact that you've had as a woman of God in her life or through her life or because of her life, how your life's been touched and transformed and changed. The power of life. You know, and this in my own regard, being raised by a mom who absolutely loved Jesus, this clearly speaks of someone who has a heart that's different, but this is someone... In John's case, he loves God. In her case, she loved God. In your case, if there's a love for Jesus Christ and there's a passion to be a godly woman, then if you have offspring, you have children, you're a mother, then I believe this pretty much translates to what your real heart is. You want to see them have a life that's transformed. You want your children to walk in, a, in, in the newness of life and a powerful life. This has to come from a heart of someone who's different. First of all, who's been changed themselves, amen? If you're a mom and you've committed your life to Jesus, your life has been transformed by the miraculous, supernatural power of the living God. But the beautiful thing about this is God gives you children. I think your heart goes out to that, that not only do you see them succeed in life, you want them to succeed in Jesus Christ first and foremost. But you have to be committed to Christ, obviously. You have to be faithful to the Word of God. And guess what happens? If you're faithful to the Word of God, that begins to exude from your life. I shared this morning the first service about a, a, a discussion taking place between four theological scholars, and they were talking about their particular favorite translation from the original language of Hebrew and the original language of Greek in the New Testament and what, how that's translated into the English, what their favorites were. One, one guy, he's kind of old school, he says, you know, my favorite translation is the King James Version. I mean, the, the beauty of the language, the, how they articulate, the eloquence of it, you know, it, it's, just, it's just hard to beat the beauty of the old English language in the King James Version. The next pastor, the next theologian said, well, you know, I'm particularly... Uh, like uh, the New American Standard or their ASV versions, Either, both of those are great because of just how literal they are and how accurate they are to the actual original Hebrew and Greek language. I just don't think you can beat it. Next scholar, he said, well, you know, I, I'm more, I really do prefer my own personal reading times, the New Living Translation. 
because of the way it uses uh, uh, the, the most current language that we would use to relate the old story, but it does it with such uniqueness, and the idioms that it uses are more contemporary to life that we live now. Sounds like a discussion we'd all like to be bored with, right? The, <laughs> the fourth guy said, <coughs> let me tell you personally, my favorite translation is my mother's translation. She had a way of just communicating the Word of God. That first of all, what she did, of course they were kind of laughing over this until they listened to what he had to say. What she would did, she would pour herself into the Word of God and let it pour itself into her. And then she would live out that w Word of God in her life and show us what the Word of God really meant. That's a pretty good translation to go by. Uh, that's probably my favorite translation. My mom was known for being a student of Scripture. She taught herself the Word of God. She, she researched. I, I remember waking up in the mornings. She would get up well before all of us six kids, and she would be at the breakfast table with the Bible open and be studying the Word of God with her notebook and her pens and her pads and always writing down Scriptures. You, you'd come home after school. You, you'd find her there before all the hectic th life of children coming home. She would be there with the Word of God, open up. She'd have a commentary or she'd be listening to some radio preacher. She'd be studying the Word of God. Late at night, she'd go in there and study the Word of God. If I went off to watch TV, she went in to watch the Bible. <laughs> she'd go in and she'd read and she would write it down and she would memorize it. She would take notes. I mean, I have right now, or I'm holding about eight to 12 probably filing cabinets of years and years of years that she kept of Bible study and notes. And, and just the Word of God was so, so valuable to her and so precious to her. So this, this is the kind of woman obviously would share that kind of verse, that I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And I think the heart cry here is that we are, you know, you as, as mothers and as women today say, I just, I want the Word of God to be, well, Job put it this way, it is more than my necessary food. I need the Word of God as much as I need to eat, if not more than I need to eat, is what he was saying. And so this is the cry of this particular kind of mom. The second point here is the motive that you see in this passage, the passion. That you see. What, is, what is really the, the driving this person? Two, ver two things are mentioned in this verse. He talks about truth, and he talks about walking, all right? Truth is obviously the Word of God. What does the Bible have to say about how we live our lives? We've said before the Bible is not just a good book. The Bible is our guidebook. This is the way we live our life. I remember years ago, the WWJD, what would Jesus do? Listen, it's really what does the Word tell us to do? Because Jesus is the living Word. What does the Word tell us to do? How do we live our lives? How do we navigate the situations? How do we answer the big questions? How, what do we do in times of crisis? Well, what does the Bible teach us? What does the Bible have to say? And that has to be poured into the life of children. Not only into our lives, into your life, into every person's life, we come back with this and say, I want God to do something unique I, in, in, in my children's life. Well, it has to start in our lives, in your life. And, you know, I praise God that, you know, the women here at Believers Fellowship are some of the smartest women you'll ever know in life. <laughs> hey, sir, you better say amen. She married you, all right? <laughs> amen. Why? Because... They have actually proven by their lives, their testimonies, the ministries that they've established in this church that they love God and they love God's Word. What better place to come in and plant your life and plant the life of your children in than a place that really focuses in, believes in, trusts in, and holds to the, the Word of God as their guidelines for living? And the, the whole church ultimately basically is like that. Our children's ministry, they're not founded on games, all right? We play games. We have fun. But the foundation of everything we do, from backyard Bible clubs to Awanas to children's church, every aspect of children's ministry comes back to teaching, preaching, modeling, instructing the children and teaching them the value and the importance of it, of just putting Scripture in your life and keeping your children exposed to the Word of God on the kind of level where they receive it, understand it, embrace it, and ultimately love it. Truth. But he says, not just that, that truth be in a child's life, but my, the joy comes from knowing that they're walking in the truth. They're living the truth. They're behaving according to the truth of God's Word. 
Not one Christian mom in this room would, I think, would tell me that any great passion in her life, this is always going to be at the top of the list. I want my children to know that they're going on. I want, my, I want to know that my children are going on with God and that they're living for Jesus and that they're committed to Christ. And I think the wise woman of Scripture, which we see a lot about, and I promise not to preach on Proverbs 31 because y'all have heard those sermons so many times. <laughs> but this passage, I think, really shows what a woman of real wisdom is how much this person loves the Word and how much they want to see this Word translated into their life. Now, that's not the story in our culture, all right? Our culture is a little different. Moms of the culture versus the moms of the Word, they want your children to speak a second language before they're five, all right? We want them to be at the top of their class. We want, you know, we're, we want them to have the right kind of body and the right kind of clothes. Listen, there's more important things than bodies and clothing. You know, their souls come first. Their hearts and their minds have to be fashioned with the things that are valuable in life. We're more interested as a spiritual mother in their spiritual life than they are in the success of their physical life. Yes, it's nice when our children achieve things, but the greatest achievements are not the, the successes in the world. There's the successes they experience in their life, things of value, things of integrity. Their relationship to Jesus becomes the priority over and above their relationship to being popular at school, making a list, being on that, this particular group, or being the best on the sports team. Those things may be nice, but the greatest thing of all is when your children will embrace spiritual values and hold their lives and surround their lives around those spiritual values. It's, their, it's not their social status we should first be concerned about. It's their spiritual eternal life that we should first and foremost be concerned about. And somebody say amen to that. Amen. This mom is interested in their lives, in their spiritual lives, and that they're walking in the truth. That's the motive here. In Acts 16, the next slide there. In Acts 16, there's this verse where, where Paul is talking about Timothy, and, and he's making reference in Acts 16 to this young man that he's met. He said, I came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, and her father was a Greek. Basically, they're saying, he's not a believer, and she is, all right? And he was, this Timothy was spoken well by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium, and Paul wanted this man, Timothy, to go with him. And he took him and circumcised him because the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that Timothy's father was a Greek. He goes on down, and he's writing to Timothy later, and he says, Timothy, continue in the things that you've learned and the things you become convinced of, knowing of who you learned them of, and that from a childhood you've known the sacred writings which were able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. There's two passages here, plus others, that deal with this man's life. But you see two things about Timothy, you know, not just the integrity and character, but there's one thing that really Paul focuses on here. He says... He kind of tells us how Timothy got this way. In one reference, he's referring to his mother and to his grandmother. And he says, you need to remember what your mother and your grandmother taught you and how they founded you in the Word of God and stand on those principles. Paul is making it very clear that Timothy was the man of God that he was in the day that he lived in, facing all the trials he faced. He was true to the Word of God because of the way he was brought up by his mother. It's possible to raise some godly kids and have an unbelieving father or even as a single mother raise some godly children because these women did it. Amen. They had the support of one another, obviously, as a mother and a grandmother. I mean, there's three qualities I noticed in Timothy's life that says about the things that obviously were instilled by a mother. One was, he's a strong believer. In Acts 16 verse, Paul said when he got there, he met Timothy, who was a, a certain disciple. And by the way, Paul never called anybody a disciple unless they were living for Jesus. There's a lot of people who call themselves disciples today. They're not necessarily living for Christ. That's not so with Timothy here. He's living for the Lord. So he calls him a disciple, and he said, you know, he said that he had a good reputation among the community, the people that surround him. So here he was. He's committed to Christ. He's committed to this issue of integrity and to character, all right? And he's learned these from where his mother and his grandmother. But also, if you notice, Timothy, one thing about it is that Paul said, I want this guy to go with me. I'd like this guy to travel with me. Not only did Paul want him to go travel, Timothy was available for mission. Timothy was available for ministry. Timothy didn't say, you know, I got some other stuff. I got some bookkeeping to do. I've got a business to run. I got a he said, I'll go to the point of circumcision. And that's definitely 
meeting the high calling here, all right, so that he could have a ministry to the Jews. And you talk about a guy who's committed, hey, this is, this is all for Jesus. I don't care what it means, what it costs me. I'm going to go all the way for God. This is this guy in Scripture. But you do, you've got to take notice that the reason this guy was who he was and was such a powerful leader in the church is because his mother's upbringing and his mother's discipling him and his grandmother's ministering to him. That's what it takes to raise warriors for Christ. Mothers, they're committed to Christ. Grandmothers, they're committed to Christ. People that want to see God do something. And out of that commitment to Christ, I think it's... Lois and Eunice, mother and grandmother, could look at Timothy's life and say, but he's walking in truth. I have no greater joy than that. Which brings me to the third point. I think Timothy fits that bill here in this passage, the miracle. God's ready to do a miracle in children's lives. And it takes a miracle. All right, because why? Because we're just naturally all stubborn. <laughs> and we're naturally all selfish. And we're naturally just going to be focused on ourselves. But it's amazing. When people get involved... And people start praying. And people are discipling. And let's get real specific. When mothers are praying, when mothers are believing, when mothers are trusting, you can be sure that the forces of hell are trembling and that the powers of God's Spirit are moving and the angels of God are moving on behalf of those prayers. I still believe in the power of prayer. I still believe in the power of God's Word. I'm not going to be focused on time nor space. I'm just going to trust God. A lot of times moms get disappointed because they see the children are not walking in truth, that they're not living the way that they really believe that, that God wants them to live, and it breaks their heart and it moves them to compassion. And I also believe, by the way, that mothers have a unique ability or a gift of discernment. You know, uh, you know I, I was that kind of guy as a young person. I loved my mom. I didn't want to hurt her in any way, so I, I put on a real good show when I was at home, you know. But when I was away from the house, you know, I, I was just like the devil. You know, I, I was very selfish, very shameful, very, you know, self-driven, didn't care, you know, what was going on around me. You know, I was one of those people who thought, you know, I can just really say I, I love someone and be committed to mom or to family, but then go off and live like I wanted to live. The, the ignorance of that is you actually think that either nobody's ever going to find out, which is always a lie. Amen. Amen. Let me make it real clear. There's nothing you ever do that's not going to be known about sooner or later. Amen. All right? Beware, the Bible says, your sin will find you out. Some people say, well, God caught me. No, you, you trapped yourself. God had to do that, all right? <laughs> and it's by the grace of God that finally got exposed. You might get right now. But moms have this unique ability to know that no matter what a good show you put on when you're around them, they see through it. That's that ministry and that capacity and that discernment that God gives them. They know. They may not know exactly what's wrong, but they know it's not right. They may know, not know exactly what you're doing, but they know you're not doing right. And it would do well for if you want a little lesson in wisdom for you to pay attention to what mom is saying or what mom is asking because she's on the right track. But I do know that there's such frustration. I watched over the years my own mother's frustration. First one gets saved, and then another gets saved, and then another got saved, and then another got saved. But this was over a period of many years, and it really wasn't until a few years before she died that all six finally got right with God. All right? But that's all in God's hands, Mom. You can rejoice. You can trust God. You can believe God that sooner or later, in time, God's going to do a great work in your, in your family. Don't give up praying. Don't give up believing. Don't give up hoping. Don't give up trusting. And certainly don't go by what these eyes see. Trust in the other eyes. Trust that the Lord's moving. Trust that the Lord's working. Because that which has brought, been put in over and over again, all that information, sooner or later, through the power of prayer and the grace of God, turns into transformation. God's going to do a work there. Some of us are more hard-headed than others. Can I get another amen? But sooner or later, there's a breakthrough and that miracles do happen. You know, there's nothing really more heartbreaking as a parent to know when your kids are messing up. Amen. It's just difficult. It really breaks your heart when you know you're messing up. But I want you to know that God is, he, he's the master cleaner of mess up. And the blood of Jesus is far reaching. And the power of God is far reaching. And that God can take that which is an absolute mess and do something so natural about it. But let me say to those who have moms, which is everybody in this room, <laughs> you wouldn't be here, okay, if you didn't have a mom. If you want to be a blessing in life, it's not flowers and chocolate. 
not going to be found in a Visa gift card, piece of jewelry. <laughs> if your mom is still alive, the best thing you can do is have a testimony for the power of God in your life, a testimony of righteousness, a testimony of character, a testimony of integrity in your life. All too often when we've been studying Proverbs on Wednesday nights, we came across this young man and these young women in Scripture who were living shameful or indecent lives. And it says in Proverbs many, many times about how that, that, this, that this child who's rebellious, and it could be at any age, but there's still this child. In fact, it calls him the foolish son or the foolish daughter. It says ultimately they're a destruction to their parents, a destructive force in, the, in, their, in their mother and father's life. Nothing more heartbreaking than know that your kids are not walking in truth. Nothing more difficult. My issue was, while I was trying to live this hidden life in another kind of world over here, thinking it didn't affect anybody over there, listen, none of us, not only will our sin be exposed, but none of us sin in isolation either. Everything I do affects people around me in a righteous way or an ungodly way. It's like you standing by the lake and no one's on it. When you take that pebble and throw it in the water and the water rings just begin to go out, those little four circles of reaction to the pebble, the whole lake is ultimately affected. Your families are affected. The people you care about are affected. Those you work with are affected. None of us lives in isolation. No man is an island. So therefore, we have to wake up and realize our responsibilities to our people that we love, the people that we call family, and the people we call friends. Quit living the quiet rebel's life and get your heart and your life right with God and be one that can be said, I have no greater joy than to know that that child is walking in truth. And your mom has passed on, then the greatest thing you can do is live this legacy and live out Jesus Christ as a testimony for the glory of God with your life, and ultimately, she's going to know about it. She'll know about it. I'm, I don't know how things work in heaven today. I can only imagine. That was a joke. <laughs> but could it be... Some people think that passage in Hebrews where it talks about we have so great a cloud of witnesses that have gone on before us, and they think that means there's this congregation in, in heaven that are kind of like up in the football stands watching what plays out in the world below them. Now, I don't think that necessarily means that. I mean, they, I believe those people is talking about have given witness to what God can do in a life that follows Jesus, and they bear witness to that. But it could be that there are moments in time, I believe, when God might peel back the curtain that separates that eternal place from this little time and space realm we live in and lets the Father lets a parent behold something. But either wise, one way or the other, we're all accountable for the way we live our lives. And it's important, as moms first and foremost today, you just continue. No matter how Satan might discourage you, you continue to trust God. No matter how frustrated you might get in the, in the process of living for Christ, you continue to trust God. I always preach Mother's Day with mixed emotions, especially now that mom's not here. But though, because there's many of us in this room that our moms aren't here today. You know? And so there's that. And then, there, then there's that mixed emotion of, of knowing that there's moms who are here today and they're saying, man, I just don't know, I'm just, I'm feeling, you know, I just feel like an absolute failure at times. I just feel like I've blown it, you know. I, I just, you know, hey, we're all in a growing process. Young moms, older moms need to let you know, you're going to be okay. <laughs> you're going to get through this. You say, well, I just feel like I'm just losing my temper. I don't need to lose my temper. I do this, I do that, I drop, I just do that. Hey, just keep it straight before the Lord. You're going to be all right. Keep taking it to the king. But I know that sometimes when you preach and you lift up a high standard, it's not to fuss at you and say, well, you sorry thing, young lady or young or old lady, you're not being what God's called you to be. It's to encourage you to say, hey, here's a standard. Let's rise to that. Let's, let's be great for God. Let's, let's rise up and be what God's called us to be. Let's, let's desire and, and have a passion and, and, and a hunger for the things of God in our life. But let's get busy about it. Amen? You have to make the Word of God a part of your life, you know. You can't just get it by osmosis coming on Sunday. But we have to embrace the truth of God's Word if we want our children to walk in the truth. We've got to live it and love it and believe it ourselves. So I encourage you. If you say, well, I've been failing it, then get back at it. Get back into the Word of God. Get back to believe in Jesus. Get back into memorizing Scripture. Get back in then mostly communicating that to your family. Amen. You're that messenger of God's grace and hope there.
There's that mixed emotion there also. A lot of women got saved later in their life and their kids are just about gone or getting close to leaving the house. I've already left the house. And that's a, that's, a, that's a challenging thing. Hey, but God knows where you are. And God's not worried about time, all right? He's a big God. So your prayers are important. Don't think, well, I didn't have the opportunity to invest. You have the time now. You've got the opportunity now. And God will honor your obedience and your commitment and your love and your prayers because he loves you as much as he loves the lady that got saved when she was 12 years old and has been faithful to it ever since. Trust the Lord. You're not a stepchild because you came in later, all right? You're his child, and he loves you, and he's committed to you. There's so many other mixed emotions of, of, of situations that we deal with today, but wherever you are in this whole relationship as women, as a mother, if you're a mom here today, receive a word from the Lord and embrace that truth and then live in it and walk in it. For those perhaps who are the rebellious children, get right with God. Get right with God, because the way you live your life affects so many people. You say, well, that doesn't bother. It, it hurts. <coughs> the same when it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You could kind of say, I have no greater sorrow than to know that my children are not walking in truth. Amen? Amen? So be that person who says, I'm going to live for the glory of God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe God. Amen? Here's what I'd like to do. I know we got some moms here that we didn't make you stand a while ago, so I'm not only going to make you stand. I want to make you come down here, meet me down front, all right, right here at the front. If you're a mom, come on down, all right? Don't wait for somebody to encourage you. If you're pregnant, all right, and it's your first baby, you're a mom, come on down. <laughs> The fruit is in the basket, all right? <laughs> you ladies are such a blessing, and sometimes you don't always feel like a blessing, but uh, God has given you such a high calling in your life and a great privilege, all right? There's many women who have probably died just to be where you're at and haven't been able to have that opportunity. So it's a great blessing. It's a great opportunity. The Bible tells us that not only children are a blessing from the Lord, they're a gift from the Lord. They're also the Lord's, their heritage. So realize that what you're doing is you're handling his properties, all right? Take good care. They belong to him. Amen. But I want to lift you up and pray for you. And I'm going to ask those that are out there, if they just reach their hand out like they're praying and laying hands on you. If you're in the audience, just raise up a hand in prayer. Reach out a hand to these and just pray for these moms. If your wife, your mother, your sister, whatever relative, relationship, whatever it might be is up here, you pray for them specifically at, at this time as well. But I want to pray for you today, and I just want to pray God's grace and blessing upon you. Fathers, we come today to recognize mothers. Lord, we realize it doesn't take a long study in Scripture to find the value, the importance of these women's life and how much lord they can reflect your life and they can show your character to a world around them even like the video we view the world desperately needs to see you father they get a very clear picture in these women's lives may you cover them today with your grace lord there's some women here this morning who may feel just uh, lord like they're not m meeting the standard oh, lord thank you for the precious blood that covers us and forgives us and washes us. Just let them sense a renewal today. Let them sense your cleansing presence in their life today. And Lord, your, your mercy and your grace, your love, your forgiveness would be just manifest in hearts today. Lord, we know that we're so far below in our own lives where you desire us to be. But Lord, help us to understand as long as we're moving forward, you're not frustrated. You're receiving us and encouraging us. For these women, God, put your hand of blessing upon their life. Lord, those would be more than just words. If we speak these words of blessing, Lord, we believe that you're blessing. May you cause your face to shine upon them. May they sense you in that blessed place in their heart and life to know your presence, Lord, to be aware of your nearness to them in these days. And Father, to know in a very real and practical way just how much you care, just how committed you are, and how much you love them. I pray you remind them of the depth of that love shown at the cross, that you went all the way to Calvary. That's how much you love them. So I pray, Lord, as you reveal that to them and speak those words of grace to them, that they, they realize it, Father, 
and they can apply that same mercy and grace to those that they love. So cover them, bless them, meet the deepest needs of their hearts, their life, their soul. God, work in their families' lives and their children's lives, God. And do that which is most honoring to you with each and every individual woman here today. In Jesus' precious name, somebody say amen. amen. God bless you, ladies. Be blessed, be blessed, be blessed. You may return to your seats. Y'all give these ladies a hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. And after they take four or five minutes hugging each other, well, <laughs> and Believer's Fellowship has been blessed with some wonderfully godly women. Wouldn't you agree? Amen. Praise God for that. I'm going to ask Brother Gary to come. We have a couple of announcements. He'll share about a gift we have for you moms as well. And God bless you. And again, God bless our mamas today. Amen. Amen. So before...